quick question first off did we have anyone here that participated in Questival last year raise your hands okay we got a few was there anyone else that was annoyed by the amount of social media posts that you saw from Questival last year <laughs> Davis apologizes about that in advance <laughs> but um, I don't want to take a lot of time introducing him because he's got a lot of great stuff to share with you I just wanted to make one point uh, before we turn the time over to him that Davis represents one of the front runners of a new type of business, a business that has a reason behind it stronger than just making himself rich. And he'll talk about that tonight. And I just want you to pay attention to this because years from now, we're gonna see this a lot more commonly. Businesses that have a purpose driving them to make money so they can actually make a difference more than just, oh, we'll donate a percentage of proceeds to some charity so we look good. And I want you to remember that so when you're look, looking back, you think, I was there and I saw one of the first guys who created a business around this and heard it from him before this was really that big of a deal. So with that being said, I'd like to turn the time over to CEO of Cotopaxi, David Smith. So it's great to be here. Um, this is, believe it or not, this is my first time in Cache Valley. Uh, I'd never been here before. So um, I was joking with a couple students earlier that my, my girlfriend in high school went here, and uh, when I was a missionary, she ended up getting married to some other guy she met here, so I've always tried to avoid this place. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's, it's great, it's beautiful. I, I, I can't believe I haven't been, I'm gonna have to make sure I, I come back, so. Um, one of my first memories as a child was as a four-year-old. And my family had left the United States and we'd moved to the Dominican Republic. And we were driving from the airport back to, um, to, to what was gonna be our, our home. And I remember as we were making this drive, I remember looking out the window and seeing children my age, three, four, five years old, standing on the streets completely naked. And even as a four-year-old, I knew something was wrong. I knew that when I went outside, I had to put my clothes on. And so I knew something was, something was off. And it was probably the first time in my life, at least the first time that I recognized it, that I felt empathy for somebody else. And this is, this is something that we as humans have. It makes us different from, from anything else, is that we have empathy for others. We feel for others. And we understand people's pain. And I ended up spending the rest of my childhood and early teenage years living in the developing world and um, then ended up also spending six years of my adult life living in the developing world. So this, this has become a part of who I am. I had a, a really unique upbringing, which I think gave me this desire to make a difference in the world. And um, I'm grateful for that. I'm, I don't know that I really did anything special to deserve that. It just ended up being something I experienced given where I, where I lived. So um, I had a, a, a number of experiences that kind of put me on, on this path of, of entrepreneurship. I'm gonna tell you a few of them. So um, I ended up coming, uh, I lived in Bolivia for a couple years as a, as a missionary. I came back um, to Utah um, to go to school. And uh, within a few months, I, I ended up reading an article in a newspaper. And this, this newspaper article really impacted me. I ended up cutting out this article um, from the newspaper, I still have it. Um, I carried it around. I cut it out and stuck it in the front of my clear, the clear face of my binder for school. And I walked around with this article for the next three years in school. And the reason that it impacted me so much was that it was about, it was a story about a man named Steve Gibson. And Steve was a, a successful entrepreneur. He'd sold his business. He was probably in his mid 60s. Um, and he ended up moving to the Philippines. And he and his wife moved there, and they bought this huge colonial mansion. And uh, instead of moving into that mansion, they ended up moving into a little one-bedroom apartment, and they started housing poor Filipinos in this large home. And they would have 25 people there at a time for two months, and they'd give them room and board, and they'd teach them how to start their own businesses. And the success was incredible. They started teaching these young Filipinos how to support their own families and how to grow little businesses. And um, it was so inspiring to me, not because this man was a, a successful businessman or because he was a, a, someone that had made millions of dollars by selling his business. 
he was impressive to me because he'd found a way to use his skills to help others. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't even know what I wanted to do when I grew up, but I knew I wanted to help people. So I held this article around. Um, I looked at it every day because I wanted it to remind me what was really important in life. And so fast forward a few years. I graduated from BYU. Um, a, a number of months later, I was back on campus for a social impact conference. And when I was at this conference, um, I was kind of walking in between sessions. And as I was walking down the hallway, I saw someone that I recognized. I'd never met him before, but I knew it was Steve Gibson, the man that this article was written about. And so I ran to that elevator. And before it closed, I stuck my arm in and stopped the elevator and got in. And I knew he couldn't escape. I had him trapped <laughs> you know, for 30 seconds. And um, I went on to tell him how I knew I knew who he was. I knew all about his, his work in the Philippines and told him how inspiring it was to me. And remember, you, you have to keep in mind, this guy is he's a multimillionaire. He's someone that's changed thousands of people's lives in the Philippines. I'm a nobody. And he was acting so flattered that I even knew who he was. And that's the kind of person Steve Gibson is and was. Um, just someone that's humble and cares more about others than himself. And I loved it. So uh, with, he asked me if I wanted to meet him in his office in a couple weeks, and I took him up on the offer. So I ended up putting together a pitch over the next two weeks where I was going to convince him to let me take his program in the Philippines to Latin America, where I'd grown up. And he was so kind because uh, you know the whole time he just smiled and complimented me. But at the end, he basically said, he's not interested. So. Uh, he basically told me, he's like, Davis, if you really want to go change the world, you need to go become an entrepreneur yourself. And then 10 or 20 years down the road, you can go take the skills that you've learned and you can go make a difference in the world. And so I left that meeting knowing what I had to do. I had to become an entrepreneur. And up to that point, I don't think I'd ever really considered becoming an entrepreneur. Um, it wasn't something that I had planned on doing from the time I was a child or anything. Um, but I knew that that's something I, I needed to do to accomplish the goals that I had. So I ended up um, teaming up with my cousin, and we started talking about what kind of businesses we could start. And we, we dabbled in a few with a few different ideas. And I'm going to tell you uh, one of the ideas, and um, it's about a spectacular failure that we had together. So as we were brainstorming ideas, I look back um, kind of its experiences that I had in life and tried to see if there was a way that I could take advantage of those you know, the experiences to build something. And one of the ideas I had was, um, I remember when I lived in Peru for a little while, um, I remember seeing women in the street selling these huge bouquets of roses, two or three dozen roses, and they'd sell them for like a dollar or a dollar fifty. And uh, it was crazy. I mean, I remember when I saw that, I was in my early 20s when I was living there, and uh, I remember thinking, I had been getting ripped off my entire life. I remember going to high school in Utah, and I was like, I was paying like 40 bucks for a dozen roses on Valentine's Day for like my girlfriend or whatever. I should have been paying like two dollars. So um, it, was, it was one of those moments where I was like, OK, maybe there's an opportunity here. So we started talking about, OK, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. Maybe we could sell some, uh, you know, start a, a business that sold roses. So I called some rose farms in, in Colombia and Ecuador and Peru and started looking at what it would be like you know, to import a container full of roses. And the more I got into it, the more I realized this is, this is way bigger than I think we're capable of doing. Like, I don't think I could sell that many roses if I wanted to. And they're perishable, so what happens if, um, what happens if they go bad? Um, what happens if I don't sell them all um, by Valentine's Day? You know, then what? So as we're going through this, it's like, OK, we need to find another way to test this idea, to figure out how to make this, see if this business could really work. So um, we ended up coming up with the idea of going to Costco. You know, Costco sells roses, and they're like $17.99. Even on Valentine's Day, we called up Costco to verify that they were $17.99. They confirmed. And so then we went to every business we could think of in Utah that was like, this huge, like a huge business, Ancestry.com. We went to Omniture, which was, ended up being acquired by Adobe, right? Um, went to New, to New Skin, all these huge companies. And we convinced their HR person to, to email the whole company and tell them about us. And the name, we named our company The Rose Company. Very original. Um, 
And uh, they send an email saying, hey, uh, the Rose Company, they are gonna be delivering a, uh, roses on Valentine's Day here at the office. So if you'd like to take advantage, you don't have to go out of the office to go hunt down roses, they'll just come straight to you. It was a great, it was a win for the company because they weren't having employees running out of, the, out of the door, you know, to go snag roses at the last minute. It was great for the employees, it was convenient. Uh, and we were charging, I can't remember, it was, it was like 29 or 39. So there was margin in it for us too. So uh, we ended up, I can't remember the exact number, but we ended up pre-selling somewhere like a, th a thousand dozen roses. And um, we were pumped. It was like, oh my gosh, this is so easy. Entrepreneurship's a breeze, man. <laughs> this, we're, gonna, we're gonna crush it with this rose business, you know? So um, Valentine's Day morning, I go to two different Costco's and I clear out every red rose I can find. And um, I think people were even upset with us. It's like, man, they're taking all the red roses. You know, there's only like white and pink left or something. So, but we were like, we were convinced we were on something. We even bought more than the, do than the thousand dozen roses that we'd pre-sold because we thought, you know, coworkers are gonna see, you know, their friends coming out and getting roses. So they're just gonna come out and buy them from us too. Well, we were too arrogant. Um, what happened was uh, at the end of the day, we realized we were in big trouble. We had a lot more roses than we, were, than we should have. And basically every penny that we'd made was like stuck in roses that were gonna go bad and that we couldn't sell. So we had to get crazy. So I like went to a mall and I started like trying to sell them to people in the mall. Uh, I ended up getting escorted out of the mall by mall security. <laughs> and so um, that was super embarrassing. And uh, my cousin was, uh, was helping and so he was, he was on a street corner trying to sell them and like a homeless guy in a shopping cart full of roses came up next to him and was like competing with him on price. <laughs> and it was like, this is awful, you know, this is, entrepreneurship was definitely harder than we thought and we decided we hated roses and never wanted to be in the rose business again. Um, fortunately, towards the end of this day, we kind of remembered where we bought the roses and we called up Costco and said, hey, we know you have a great return policy do you have a return policy on roses? And they're like, nope, you can bring them back, no problem. So it was like, yes, thank you, Costco. <laughs> you know, so I feel like, I think I, I feel like a debt of gratitude to Costco now for I think the rest of my life. So, um, but uh, it had a great experience um, kind of failing in a business and failing fast. So we tried a few different, a few different businesses like this where we dabbled in something uh, put maybe $500 or $1,000 into an idea, tested it really quickly, and within a few weeks or a month, we knew we could either move on or really kind of focus on that business. One of those ideas that I had was a business um, selling pool tables. And so uh, I, I had this idea by talking to a good friend of mine who, uh, who worked for eBay. And he mentioned to me that there was a company that sold a lot of pool tables on eBay. And immediately I knew I could do that. So I ended up within a couple weeks, I, I had flown to China, I, I did some Google searches for pool table factory in China, found a few factories that I started communicating with, flew out there, and we started selling these things online, uh, on eBay and through our own website. And pretty soon we had people um, contacting us saying, hey, I noticed that uh, you're in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, can I come see your showroom? Well, we didn't have a showroom. We had, basically we had pool tables from this, these factories in China shipping the product to a warehouse in Salt Lake and then we were shipping them out all over the country. But I'd actually never even seen one of our own pool tables set up before. So, uh, but like any good salesperson, you don't say no. So they're like, oh, can we come see your showroom? It's like, of course you can. Uh, I'll give you a call tomorrow and we'll set up an appointment for you to come visit. And they're like, great. So uh, then we go, my cousin and I convince our, uh, my aunt to let us put a pool table in her basement and um, we spent the whole night painting the basement, putting a light, like making this look like a little showroom. And then we gave her a cell phone and said, if anyone calls, sell them a pool table. And um, it was amazing. She started selling pool tables for us every single day. And it was, uh, it was enough validation where I was like, okay, we need to go open up a store. And my aunt was begging us to please uh, get out of her basement. So, <laughs> um, you know, so we, uh, we ended up opening our first store in Salt Lake. And then a few months later, I moved out to Georgia. We opened up a store there. And over the next year, six years, we ended up building stores around the country and became the largest retailer of pool tables in the US. And so um, keep in mind, this is a very small industry. It was not that impressive of a business, you know, but it, but it, it was 
you know, for us as young entrepreneurs, it was, a, it was incredible. We couldn't believe what we'd built. And um, I, I discovered that I had a passion for entrepreneurship and I had a knack for it. So we decided also we didn't want to be the pool table guys forever. So we decided to sell the business and go to business school. So I ended up going to the Wharton School out in, in Philadelphia. Um, the building that we all, that the Wharton's in is called Huntsman Hall. And so uh, named after John Huntsman, which is kind of cool to be here at the Huntsman, uh, the Huntsman Business School, is it called? What, the Huntsman School or Huntsman Business School? So, um, so when I was at Wharton, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm ready to start another business. I'm ready to take kind of these experiences I had I have a couple years in doing my MBA to kind of step back and reflect on those experiences, what we did right, what we did wrong, what we could do better and different. And so we started brainstorming all these ideas. And one of the ideas I had was, um, actually I'm gonna take a step back. Um, I'm gonna tell you about the process we went through because I think that's important. And I think you guys could maybe learn something from this. So um, instead of just like jumping into our first or second great idea, we decided to approach it in a very disciplined way where the first year in business school, all we did was brainstorm. It was ideation. And we were very careful to not jump into an idea so deep that we stopped the ideation process. And so that first year we came up with 60 business ideas. And then we took those 60 business ideas and we went out to Silicon Valley. My cousin was in Boston going to Harvard Business School. I was in Philly, so we thought, hey, let's just go somewhere you know, either I'm gonna have to go to Boston or he's gonna have to come down to Philly, or we can just go somewhere totally different. And we thought, why not go to Silicon Valley? Like immerse, our, immerse ourselves in entrepreneurship, be surrounded like in this epicenter of, uh, you know, of, of the startup world. And so we ended up going to Silicon Valley. We spent the first couple weeks just taking these ideas and refining them, cutting them down from the 60 all the way down to four. And we had four ideas that we kind of identified as big, big ideas that we felt um, could be significant businesses. And so um, we spent the rest of the summer, th two or three months, working on those four ideas, vetting them, testing them, figuring out which of those four ideas was gonna be the best idea to move forward with. And at the en end of the summer, we'd committed to, to figuring out one idea that was gonna be the best and working on that the last year in business school. So um, the idea that we decided to run with was uh, a business selling baby products in Brazil. And we knew it was gonna be big. So um, we ended up um, going back to school and that, that second year school, we just started cranking on this business and we got crazy. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was go, we had to go raise um, venture capital. We knew that if we wanted to do this business, we had to go raise a significant amount of money. It wasn't just gonna be something we could go bootstrap like we did our last business. Um, raising money from grandma or from friends and family. So um, we had, uh, you know, one of our first, one of our first meetings was, um, actually our very first VC pitch was in New York. And it was an investor who had invested heavily in Brazil and we were super excited to meet with him. And we ended up going to this meeting and it was super intimidating. I mean, we were so scared because we'd never talked to a VC before. We'd never pitched a business. And this business idea was very, it's in its infancy. You know, we had nothing but a PowerPoint presentation. So we get into this office, there's a big glass wall, and in, he's inside this conference room uh, on this other side of the glass wall, and we can hear him screaming at someone um, on the phone. And it was making us super, we were nervous already, but seeing him screaming at somebody was making us even more scared. So uh, after about five or 10 minutes, he comes out and he says, come in, so we go in, and uh, he immediately just says, pitch. There was no like chit chat or anything. He just wanted us to pitch. So we bring up our first slide and um, it just has our logo. And the, the name of the company at this point was fraudas.com. And I don't know, does anyone here know Portuguese? So fraudas means diapers. It's kind of an ugly word in Portuguese and kind of is in English too. So uh, just like not, not the most pleasant word in the world. And uh, he immediately just says, What's that? What's fraudas.com? We're like, oh, this, you know, this means diapers. And he's like, I know what that means. Like, why did you choose that name? And we're like, oh, well, there's this company in the U.S. called diapers.com. They're, you know, huge business. They do like five, you know, they just sold to Amazon for half a billion dollars. And he's like, no, I, of course, I know, I know what diapers.com is. But what I'm asking is, why did you choose a .com? Everything in Brazil is .com.br. 
And uh, we kind of looked at each other, we're like, yeah, this is just a placeholder. Uh, we didn't tell them that we just spent five grand buying the domain a couple <laughs> days before. So we, we started off this pitch really badly. <laughs> I mean, we were like sick to our stomachs from this first second. It was like, what have we done, you know? So, um, you know, but we go through this pitch and, you know, he's just tearing us apart. I mean, it was ugly. Um, and, you know, halfway through the pitch, he, the phone rings, he takes the call and yells at someone else for a few minutes. And, um, you know, we leave this, this meeting just thinking it was awful. And, um, you know, as we started talking, we're like, man, you know, this guy was, he was such a jerk. And, you know, but we, we really sucked. And, you know, there was no way we we're going to raise money. And then it was like, well, maybe, you know, I wonder, maybe he didn't hate us. You know, we, we spent an hour and a half in his office. A guy like that wouldn't spend an hour and a half with us if he hated us. So, you know, we're having this debate. We look down at our phones and we see an email from him and he's like, I'm in. I want to give you a million dollars to start the business. And we're like, what? This is crazy. So we're like high-fiving each other in the streets of New York. We're just like, oh, this is like amazing. And um, as we were eating dinner, we decided, you know what? Um, we started asking each other, like, if he called us right now, would you want to answer the phone? He's like, no way, man. It's like, we know what happens when he gets on the phone. He just, like, screams at people. So well, that's when we decided, you know what, we are not going to raise money from this guy. But what he did do is he validated that we had something special. So we started cranking on how we could make this business work and how we could make it more valuable. And so one of the things that we did was we started looking at domain names. And I know a few of you were at the eBay session uh, a few months ago that I spoke at. So you're gonna, you've already heard this story, but I think I'm going to tell it again because it's good. So, because um, I think it, it's something that any of you guys could have done. And so we knew we had to find a great domain name. We'd, we'd had the pooltables.com domain in the billiard industry, and it was amazing the impact that it had on our business. So we decided, you know, we need to go find a great domain name in the baby space. And we identified this domain, baby.com.br. Uh, it was perfect. Uh, it was short. Every Brazilian knows the word baby. They know how to spell it. Um, it's in English, but uh, you know Brazilians, they love things from abroad. They love things from Europe. They love things from the United States. So it actually kind of set it as like a premier brand. And um, so I immediately contact the owner of this domain. It's some guy. He's just squatting on the domain. It's just basically like a one-page thing. Nothing's being sold. There's no content. And so I knew it would be for sale. So I ended up getting this guy's contact information. He responded to my email, we got on the phone. I spoke horrible Portuguese. He only spoke, he didn't speak any English, so, or he spoke probably English as well as I spoke Portuguese, frankly. So, uh, you know, but we had this broken conversation that ended up lasting, this negotiation ended up lasting a couple months. And at the end of the day, uh, I, I just, it was pulling teeth just trying to get him to tell me how much he wanted for the domain. Because he was clearly willing to walk at any moment. He'd bought 70 domains in 1999 and he was said, and he hadn't sold any of them, zero. So he was like, he's just like, I'll sit on this forever. I get so many inquiries, like I don't need to sell this today. I just want the right price. So finally he told me he'd be willing to sell it for a half million to a million dollars. This is just for a domain name, right? So um, at first it was like, no way, like that's impossible. But uh, we bought the pooltables.com domain for a lot of money and the hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, not quite that much, but we knew, um, we knew that there was power in these generic domains. And as we started talking about it, we decided, you know what, this domain really could be worth a half million dollars if we, if we executed right. And so I came back to him and said, okay, I'm going to make an offer. I, I'm going to make an offer to pay you a half million dollars for this domain. But um, I'm not going to give you a half million dollars today. I'm going to make you, uh, I'm going to make monthly payments for five years. And the, the, the payments kind of escalate over time. So as the, as the time goes on, they get bigger and bigger. So the first few months are, are smaller. And what that does is it allows us to, to buy a domain at, with very low risk, very low, low amount of money. And if things don't work out in six months, we didn't pay all that money for a domain. We just paid a smaller amount. And then we can stop paying. He gets to keep all the money we paid him. He gets to keep the domain. And it's great for everybody. So, um, and I tell him, hey, you know, you've got basically uh, till the end of the day to just tell me if you're going to get this, if you're going to do the deal or not. Because if not, we need to go buy another domain. And so he comes back and says, uh, you know what, I, I've read the offer and I'm going to accept it. Um, you can pay me half a million dollars over five years, but at the end of five years, you need to give me a million dollars or you need to give me 10% of your revenues for 10 years. So I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is loony. And I was so frustrated. Uh, 
I was, it's like I've been wasting two months talking to this guy, and he's never going to do a deal. There's a reason he had not sold the domain. He's crazy. And so, um, you know, I, I told him, hey, look, it's Friday. Why don't we connect on Monday? I need to, you know, I, need to, I, can, I can just tell you right now, the deal you offered is never going to happen. We cannot pay more than half a million, but let's connect on Monday. So I cooled down over the weekend, and I think more about it. And I, on Monday, instead of coming back to him and just being upset, I just said, hey, look, help me understand where you're coming from. Because what you're coming back with is like, it's, I see it as unreasonable because it's so much more than we'd ever talked about. And he said, well, look, you're trying to pay over five years. You know, there's inflation risk, there's currency risk, there's political risk, there's, you know, what if you took the domain and it, I had to sue you to get it back and it took 10 years to get it back in the Brazilian legal system. So I, as he was explaining this, like, I get it, you know? I get it, I get why he's wanting a big upside because there's a downside for him. And so <clears throat> I said, okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, if I give you a half million dollars today, you'll sell me the domain. And he said, yes. So I was like, okay, you, you got a deal. We're gonna do it. And this is how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna wire you today $5,000. And you're going to put my logo up on the website, on baby.com.br, and you're gonna, the logo's gonna say, have our logo and say, coming soon. And you have that up for 90 days. At the end of 90 days, I will give you the balance payment. I will give you the rest of the half million dollars. If I don't give you the money, you can keep the five grand, and you can go back to putting your own landing, you know, your own little page on that site again. And he said, deal. So then I had 90 days to go sell the tar out of this business to VCs. And so that's what I did. Uh, and we got, uh, we ended up raising four and a half million dollars on a PowerPoint presentation. And largely because we had this incredible domain, baby.com.br, and we just told them, we are entrepreneurs, we know how to build e-commerce businesses, and we're gonna go crush the baby space in Brazil. And uh, we ended up using that four and a half million dollars to help pay for this domain. And investors did know that we hadn't finished paying for the domain, but they loved how scrappy we were in being able to acquire it. So again, this is something that any of you guys could have done. Any of you guys could have gone and got this domain. Um, and that's what entrepreneurship is all about. It's about figuring out a creative solution to problems. It's about finding a, a way to, without a whole lot of money, being able to find a way to, to do something amazing. So we ended up launching this business, and um, when we were in school, we started building the team. I started traveling down to Brazil between classes, so I'd, I set up all my classes on Tuesday and Thursday. I'd fly out, um, I'd go straight from the Wharton School, I'd take my bag from my class, I'd go straight to the airport in Philly, I'd fly down to Sao Paulo, and then when I was, uh, I'd be there um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Monday night, I'd jump on a plane to Sao Paulo, I'd fly back to, to Philadelphia, and I'd go straight from the airport to my first class on Tuesday. It was awful. And uh, luckily that didn't last long. I graduated, moved down to Brazil, and um, it took six months to get our business entity. It was, it was a nightmare. It took so, so long. It was so frustrating. We had an entire team sitting in an office ready to go, and we couldn't sell anything because we didn't have our business entity set up. So um, six months later, we ended up finally getting it. We launched the business, and uh, within 30 days, we had um, a woman named Angelica. She's one of Brazil's biggest celebrities. Um, her husband, his name is Luciano Huki, and he's also a huge celebrity, he has more Twitter followers than the New York Times, he has like 15 million Facebook fans. And um, this woman ended up contacting one of our investors and saying, hey, I wanna be a part of this business, this baby.com.br business. Can you connect me with the, with, the, with the founders? And so this investor comes and says, you will not believe it, Angelica just called and she wants to be a part of this business. And it's like, oh, Angelica, I don't know who that is, so uh, thanks but no thanks. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand, this is Angelica. And it's like, who is Angelica? I don't even know who that is. And he's like, dude, she's like one of the most famous people in Brazil. And I was like, okay, um, as an American, you're just thinking, I can think of all these celebrities that I know, and they're all losers. You know, they're, it's just a matter of time before they get caught doing something embarrassing. So we're totally jaded, and you know, as, as Americans, we're just like, no, no thanks. We're not, we're not gonna tie our brand to some celebrity. And he's like, no, you don't understand. Like, these are like incredible people. You will love meeting with them. So we we're still like, ah, I don't think we're, we're, this is our thing. And finally this investor's like, look, if you'll do this, if you'll meet with Angelica, I will fly you from Sao Paulo to, to Rio in my private jet. And it was like, oh, private jet? It's like, <laughs> all right. So I was like, actually we thought about it a little more and I think we'd like to take you up on that offer, you know? So it's like, so first time on a private jet, I loved it and it was like, dude, this is unreal. So. Then we go meet with Angelica and Luciano, and I was blown away. It was like the nicest people you could ever imagine. 
I mean, th and I understand now why Brazilians love them so much, because they're always looking for ways to do good in their communities. And just authentically kind, nice people. And so we ended up striking a deal with them where Angelica became our CMO, our chief mommy officer. And so <laughs> she was the face of the brand, and um, it shot us through the stratosphere. Um, within 18 months, we were a $100 million business. And it was just, it was more than we'd ever imagined. It was just a crazy experience. And um, within six months of launching Baby, we launched another site called Jinda. Jinda is actually still operating. We have a few hundred employees there. Um, my cousin is still in Brazil running that business. And so we just had um, just an incredible ride. And in a lot of ways, it was a dream come true. You know, we built an incredible business. Brazil startup of the year in 2012. We, um, you know, I was living in Latin America again like I had when I was a kid. My, my daughters, my two daughters were speaking Portuguese. It was, it was everything I'd ever hoped for. Um, at the same time, I knew I knew I needed to leave. And people thought I was crazy. People did not understand why I, I would want to leave. But um, it came back to the experiences I'd had living in the developing world as a child um, and as an adult, and a promise I had made myself a long time before. And I'm gonna show a little video here that's gonna help you understand. It's, I'm gonna tell you a story my wife is going to help me do it on this video. And um, it's a story about an experience that we had living in Peru together. And it was an experience that kind of changed um, the way we saw the world and what we wanted to do. In 2001, my wife and I were newlyweds, and we decided that we wanted to have an adventure together. So we found this unpaid internship in Peru. And we decided to do it together. So we went off to Lima and spent some time there. And then towards the end of this time, we decided to go up to Machu Picchu. So we flew to Cusco, the city close to Machu Picchu. Anyone that's been to Cusco, the first place you go is the main plaza. Right when you walk into the main plaza, there's street children everywhere. And they're always looking to approach you and sell you uh, finger puppets or jewelry or, or postcards or to shine your shoes. We unexpectedly befriended a, a little a little street kid, a kid that shines shoes. We were so desperate to shine Davis's shoes, and so he just stuck out to us. And I, I had tennis shoes on, and it, but he, he was so insistent that he wanted to shine my shoes. <laughs> we brought him some extra food, and he was so happy. He shared it, he gathered his friends, and they all ate it together. And from then on, we knew we wanted to look for him every day. After doing something kind like that and seeing that type of reaction, you know that you want to keep doing it. One of our last nights in Cusco, we were walking back to our hotel. It was around 11.30 at night. We saw two little children cuddled on the side of the street. And I recognized Edgar right away. We had to wake him up, and we were so shocked to see him out that late. I could see uh, on his face that he'd been crying, and he told me that uh, his shoe shining kit had been stolen earlier that day and he was afraid to go home. It was just a heartbreaking thing to see this, this poor little kid um, going through this experience. We, we gave him a little money that we had so we could tell that he felt better. The next day, we were leaving on the bus and we saw him on the steps to the cathedral. And we saw a little Edgar running, running towards the bus window. And we immediately opened up this window and we could see he was, he was happy and he had this, this big bag of candy that he bought that he was selling uh, to make money. And it was just enough time for us to, to say goodbye to Edgar and the, as the bus started rolling away. He ran next to the bus and just waved goodbye to us. In fact, I've, I've been telling the story since 2001, just telling people about Edgar and this experience that we had. After that, we knew that at some point in our married life, we wanted to help disadvantaged children in other countries. Simply because of, of where they were born geographically in the world, they have incredibly difficult lives. And it doesn't take much to impact them. No, it's not too late for other children. There are other children like Edgar that we can help uh, in a real way help impact their lives. Protopaxi is about finding a way that we can sustainably give back to the world. So, on that bus, as we 
left Cusco, my wife and I, we made a, a commitment to each other, a promise. And that promise was that we would find a way to help kids like Edgar. And we weren't exactly sure how we were gonna do it, but we knew we would. And it's something that we talked about all the time. It wasn't something that we forgot about. It was something that no matter where we lived, it was something we constantly discussed. And so when I was in Brazil, I knew, I knew it was time for me to go do something more meaningful. It wasn't about building a massive business. It wasn't about making money. It was about finding a way to make the world better. And we ended up moving back to the States about a year ago. And I started putting together, I started putting together a team, a team of amazing people um, that I knew could help us build this business. And the whole idea behind Cotopaxi was having this impact. Um, every single product was tied to a story, tied to a cause. And so we have a backpack called the Cusco. It's one of our best-selling packs. Um, there's, you see them all over college campuses. Um, you know, th this pack is, is actually helping a little shelter in Cusco, Peru that helps street children. Um, street children just like Edgar. And, um, you know, if you buy the Kilimanjaro pack, it's helping a little, a little orphanage in Tanzania. So every product has its own story. Um, one kind of cool addition to the story, my wife and I filmed this um, right when we got back um, from Brazil. And I had never been back to, to, Port, to Peru um, since 2001 until last year. But, um, you know, that experience was so impactful, I knew that I had to go back at some point. And I, when I went back, I wanted to go walk through the streets of Cusco. I wanted to remember the feelings that I had back in 2001. And while I was there, I knew I also wanted to try to find Edgar. And so I went back last year to Cusco to try to remember these experiences I had. And while I was there, I started this search for this little boy who was no longer a boy. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know his last name. Uh, I, all I knew was his name was Edgar. I knew he was nine years old in 2001. And so um, I won't go into the whole story, but it was literally a, a miracle. Um, I, I really feel divine intervention. I found Edgar. And uh, one of the most emotional experiences of my life. Um, when we found each other, we embraced. He remembers the night that he was sleeping on the street that someone had stolen a shoe shining kit. Um, he asked me if I would go see his house. He was so proud to show me his house because he had built it himself. It turns out that his, his parents had died. He was an orphan um, as, a, as a child. His younger brother, who was nine years old, uh, was born and then his mom died giving birth and then his father had died of alcohol abuse. So he's now raising his little brother, he's raising his teenage sister, and he took me to his house and it was a mud house, dirt floors, a hole in the ground for a toilet. And a piece of me was depressed. But another piece of me was bursting with pride, seeing what this person had built was so little. And so, um, luckily, he's like one of the most active people I've ever met on Facebook. So we communicate all the time. <laughs> and so, um, uh, this is Edgar today. And it's been a, one of the most meaningful relationships I've had. And so, um, that's the story of Cotopaxi. And so, um, you know, we're building a brand that's about helping make the world better about making a difference in the world. And we did it, we've done it in a unique way. And I think, um, how many pe people here have heard of the festival before today? So a, a big chunk of you. So um, we decided to launch this business the very first day with an event called the Questival. Uh, I had just moved back from Brazil. We were just getting this thing started. But um, we ended up having uh, 1,400 racers that competed in this event. It was basically people, you'd form a team, You'd run around doing all these challenges, either outdoor challenges or service in the community, all these things that were tied to our core values as a brand. And then we sent the winning teams on humanitarian trips around the world. And at the end, we had this huge finish line music finale, and we had about 5,000 people that participated in the festival during those 24 hours. And so um, it ended up being an amazing way to spread our brand. We had 30,000 social media posts the day of our launch. So I'm very sorry if we took over your your social media for, for 24 hours. Uh, I know a lot of people were like, my gosh, all I saw was Questival. So, um, 
but that was a, it was a great way for, to build awareness around what we were doing. So, um, you know, we built uh, just an amazing brand around these uh, amazing products, um, kind of this aspirational brand, but also building a brand not just around great product, but around great experiences. And so um, I was going to show, maybe we, have, we, maybe we have time. Do we have time? Okay. Okay. So um, with this question, I'm going to show a quick video. It's just a, a few minutes long, but to kind of show you what it was about. And so, you know, during that quest, during the Questival, we had, um, you know, we did 850 hours of, of service, community service. That's hard. No one wants to go do service. Even people that are good people don't want to go do service sometimes, right? So the amazing thing is that we saw people doing these crazy things um, with their friends, making a difference in the world, having a blast, people sleeping under the stars for the first time in their lives. And they're doing this because of this event. And it was, it was really touching to see. So um, this is a, a video that I want to try to play. It, we need to, how do you want to? Yeah, so there's like a, let me see if I can help. It was a good attempt. <laughs> you can go watch it on our website. So um, the idea was basically we got people out doing amazing things together. And we did, uh, we did a second Questable in San Francisco at the end of last year. And then this year we have 20 or 30 of these events scheduled over the year. So we're doing one in Las Vegas in a couple weeks. Um, we're going to be doing um, another one here in Salt Lake April 10th and 11th. And um, this year we're doing something a little different where instead of sending a team by itself on a humanitarian trip, every single winning Questable team in every city is going to fly together down to Central America and they're going to race from Belize to Panama and they have to cross all seven countries in Central America by foot. Um, they can't fly, you can take buses or whatever you want to get around but you have to walk across each border and then the winning team, um, Questable team of the, of the World Championship Questable is going to get a, tick, a trip around the world with their team. And um, also when we have all those teams there we're going to do a massive service project where we have we can do something actually really meaningful, where we, you know, we have 100 people or, or something that it can actually go tackle a really cool project. So, um, so definitely keep an eye out for the Questable. I'd love to see a ton of you guys out there. I think, uh, I think Utah State represented pretty well um, as far as numbers, but I think especially as far as performance. You guys are, you guys are legit. Uh, I think way more legit than people down south. So, um, so anyways, that's... Uh, that's the story of Cotopaxi. And um, before we jump into Q&A, I just want to make a, two challenges to each of you. My first challenge is to find a way to change the world through entrepreneurship. Don't be afraid to start a business. Um, it, can, it feels scary, but it's, it's no riskier than going and working for someone else. Have the courage to try something. Now is the perfect time as students. You can test things. You can experiment with ideas. You don't, have any, you don't have any risk while you're in school. Now's the time to be testing things and experimenting and finding a way that you can go build something meaningful. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by Dieter Uchtdorf, and he says, the desire to create is one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul. All of us have this inside of us, whether it's to create something, uh, art, music, business, we all have that inside of us. Um, my second challenge to each of you is to make the world better. No matter what you choose to do in your career, Look for a way to impact people outside of yourselves. And I promise you, as you do that, you're going to be happy. Um, I really appreciate the time being here. And uh, I guess we'll open it up to, to Q&A. Yeah. When you were working in Jamaica, right, you mm -hmm. saw all these bullets and um, what kind of an impact that had on you? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question was basically, um, how nice was it to have a partner? You know, I had my cousin. Um, and I talked a little bit about this earlier today with a few students, but um, it's funny, like having a partner early on can be very helpful. You know, it's, it's so nice to have someone that you can bounce ideas off of and that you can 
solve problems with together. But long term, it ends up usually being a challenge, um, especially if you split the business 50-50. We were co-CEOs. So it ends up, it, it's, it can be a challenging thing. Probably one of the most challenging things you'll do in businesses work with a partner. Um, so my advice to you guys would be, instead of um, going and finding your best friend or a family member to go start a business with, um, you can work with someone, get a friend to help you brainstorm ideas. And maybe just both of you say, hey, look, we're gonna, sh we're gonna share a Google Doc together. We're gonna brainstorm all these ideas. You're gonna keep me accountable. I'm gonna keep you accountable. We're gonna come up with one idea a day for the next two months. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna discover a bunch of cool things. But we're, gonna, we're gonna also gonna commit to work on these ideas on our own. And then, once you have your right idea, then go try to build the best team you can to solve the problems that you have for that business. It's unlikely that your best friend is gonna be the best person that you can find to go solve whatever problem it is that for that business that you start. So um, it is very tempting, I understand that, to go start a business with someone that you, that you really like, but um, it can also be incredibly challenging and trying for, for that relationship. So um, I think it's, it's a lot easier if you just go build the best team you can with the smartest people that solve the right kind of problems that you have. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, I don't think you're asking this question, but I'm gonna answer it anyways. Uh, the name Cotopaxi comes from a volcano in Ecuador where I lived as a kid, so that's why I named it Cotopaxi. But why, you know, why this space, you know, why gear? Uh, because I love it. Um, I knew that this business was a business of passion and I wanted to choose a business. I knew I needed to build something that could help people. I wasn't sure what it was, but I chose a business that I knew I would love doing, which is the outdoor space. Um, I also felt like people that, um, that spend time in the outdoors or people that travel the world, um, you know, they've experienced that feeling of connecting with something bigger than themselves. And um, I felt like they would understand this mission better than most. And so that's why I chose the space. It is very, very crowded. Um, there's a lot of brands, um, but we're doing something pretty unique. We're building a brand in a way that no other outdoor brand has been built. And um, it's been really challenging and really fun. Yeah, next, next question, yeah. Um, what sort of business is Cotopaxi? Like, what kind of business is Cotopaxi? Yeah. Like, what, what are the types of things that they do? Yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, for those that didn't hear, um, you know, generic domains were something that I, 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 there's something I believe in. You saw my last businesses, but we didn't do this with this business. And the reason why is because I knew this business was about building an amazing brand that people wanted to be a part of. And I knew that backpack.com wouldn't be that, right? So um, I very you know, intentionally did not choose the generic domain, tried, tried to choose a domain that I felt resonated with why I was building this business. And when I thought of Ecuador, my time growing up there, I used to go backpacking at, at Mount Cotopaxi with my dad. It's one of the highest active volcanoes in the world. Um, it's at 20,000 feet above sea level. Um, and uh, it, the school I went to in Ecuador as a kid, the international school, it's called Cotopaxi. So I always loved the name and it, it kind of tied in the outdoor adventure piece and also the humanitarian piece for me. So that's why I chose the name. So, um, yeah, back here. You know, I joke uh, with investors. Um, you know, when I was going to fundraising for, for Cotopaxi, I went to Silicon Valley. The day I came back from Brazil, instead of coming to Utah, I flew to New York and then Silicon Valley to fundraise. And <clears throat> investors asked me the same question, like how is this gonna be different from Brazil? And I, I joked that um, starting a business in Brazil and running it was like running a marathon at high altitude. And so like coming back to the States, it was like running at the beach, you know, or you know, sea level. It was amazing, it was so much easier. So. Um, you know, I, Brazil was amazing, an amazing opportunity, but incredibly challenging. I mean, uh, one example, um, running my businesses in the US, I have never been sued once, ever, not even close. In Brazil, one of our first meetings with our executive team, my COO, who's Brazilian, says, okay, we have 11 pending lawsuits. And it was like, oh my gosh, like, what have we done? Like, did we like kill a child or something? Like, and he's like, oh no, this is like normal business, um, you just get sued a lot. And I was like, well, what did we get sued for? And like, he's like, well, this first one, we got sued because the woman says that she paid for gift wrapping. It was five reais, which is like $2. And, um, and it arrived not gift wrapped. 
And so we lost a $5,000 lawsuit. And it was like, I can't believe that. Like, that's insane. And so uh, we started, and these lawsuits were like never ending. It was like always, you know, you delivered it or you did something. And um, it, was more, it was more expensive to go fight it in court. So it was really hard to do business there. Um, that said, uh, you know, all these barriers to entry that are created um, end up being great because it's, you have less competitors. So um, doing business in the US is very easy. And we're, you're all lucky to be here because this really is one of the most incredible places in the world to start a business. It's, anyone can do it. So yeah, back here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is important to me. So one thing I wanted to do with Cotopaxi was I wanted every product to be tied not just to giving something. I didn't want it to be if you bought a backpack, we gave a backpack to somebody. I wanted people to, to connect with the people like I had when I went to an orphanage or when I, when I worked with Edgar. I wanted people to try to experience a piece of that. And so I wanted every single product to be tied to a cause. So if you buy the India water bottle, you're giving a little village in India clean water. You're giving someone six months of clean water for every bottle that we sell. And so there's a story behind every one. And not only that, but we tie it into the product. So on the India water bottle, we have a native pattern from India. In the, in the, you know, the Cusco backpack, we have a native pattern from Peru inside the pack. It's subtle. It's not something you see from the outside necessarily, but it's there. Um, you know, we have a human lifespan warranty on the packs instead of a lifetime guarantee. It's actually tied to the, the average lifespan of someone in the underdeveloped world, which is 61 years. So um, every aspect of the brand is tied to, this, to the story uh, of our social mission. Um, even when you get it, when you buy a pack um, and you get, uh, when you get the package, you always get a thank you note, uh, a handwritten thank you note. Originally it was written by us, but as the business grew, that got harder to do. And so we've actually had, um, we work with refugees in Salt Lake, um, 16 to 18 year old kids that have moved from some war torn country or you know, places where they've had to seek religious asylum here in the United States. And these kids, they get their first job. We've, we've, we're working with them and teaching them how to, you know, what it's like to have a real job. And they, they write these thank you notes for them. We pay them $10 an hour, which is like more than double what I was paid at that age. Um, I think minimum wage is a little higher than now than it was when I was working. But um, one funny story about that actually, as we, we came back to do the second round and one of the kids wanted to quit. And uh, the, the, the girl on our team that kind of runs this program was like, wait, why? Why do you want to quit? And she, he's like, well, you didn't pay me. And we'd cut them checks. But it, he's like, no. She's like, well, we, we gave you a check. And he's like, well, no. No one wants to take this check. No one will take the check. So I want to quit because you're not, you're not paying us. And then we found out like, not one of these kids had cashed the checks. They didn't know what to do with them. They didn't have bank accounts or anything. So, we, uh, we helped them, this girl like helped them open up bank accounts and so they could actually deposit it. But uh, great learning experience. It was like, they thought they weren't getting paid. So um, kind of a, a fun story. But again, like trying to tie the social mission to every part of, of the brand and business. So um, yeah, let's go over here. So your, your diet company was all about money. When you made this, did you care about the financial end or mm -hmm. just the social? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Did I care just? With this business, do I care about just the, the social side or also the financial side? Uh, of course I care about both because I know I can't have the social impact I want if the business fails. The more successful I can make this business financially, the more impact we can have with the business. Um, I don't know a business in the world that's as generous as we are with the money that we make. And so even though we're not even profitable yet, we cut a check, every quarter we cut checks to all of our nonprofit partners. and. Um, and we just pretend that we made money. So, um, so yeah, it's something that's really important to me, but of course we need to make the business financially viable. So that's, a, that's something that, of course, we work towards every day. So, yeah. Um, let's maybe, do I, I don't want to miss anyone. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of any business other than Cotopaxi. Um, I do have uh, ownership in the business in Brazil and the pool table business, even though I sold it, I still have a minority ownership as well, but again, not involved in the day-to-day. -day. I think it's hard enough to run one business. I can't imagine trying to run more than one. So usually, uh, once I step away, I'm, I'm gone. Like, I, I don't wanna, I wanna really be 100% focused on the next thing, so 
Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So what made Brazil unique? 200 million people, one of the largest countries in the world. 40% um, internet penetration, uh, kind of a magic number. Less than 40% and the, it's very, it's still very emerging. So it's, you, you're not, it's not gonna be big enough to actually get traction online. Um, credit card penetration was very, very high so people could buy online. And um, uh, you know, a place that I, even though I'd never lived in Brazil, I'd spent so many years in Latin America, I knew that I would love it and I knew I could, I could figure it out. So, but primarily based on the, the size of the opportunity. Everyone was getting online, this is in 2010, everyone was getting online. And so, first thing you wanna do when you get online, when you get the internet for the first time, is you wanna like buy something and see if it works. Something actually shows up at your house when you click on a button. So, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a great question. So what, uh, the question is why, um, do, you know, the other business I started, did they have some kind of social angle and why didn't they? Um, they did not have a social angle. And um, part of that is that this, this idea of a business being kind of a cross between a nonprofit and a for-profit is pretty new. Um, the second part of that is it's hard to do that. You know, with my last business in Brazil, if I would have, we'd raised a little over $40 million from venture capital firms. So. If I would have started giving away the money every quarter, started writing checks to causes that I cared about in Brazil or something, my investors would have sued me. You know, they would have been, they would have been ticked. It's like, hey, like, that's our money. You can't just start, you know, giving it away. Um, so what I did different was I, I knew that I, if I was going to do this, I had to start fresh. And so I incorporated from day one as a benefit corporation. It's a new type of entity that um, it's a it's a for-profit entity, but you have a social mission. It's you're responsible to shareholders, not just to make a profit, but to do good. And so um, we were the first company to incorporate as a benefit corporation. We were incorporated in Delaware, uh, one of the first benefit corporations in Delaware. But we were the first uh, company to incorporate as a benefit corporation from inception and raise venture capital. Um, I was told by a ton of people, including some very senior attorneys that deal with venture in the venture space, that told me, do not incorporate as a benefit corporation and go try to raise money because it's never been done. Like investors do not want to fund benefit corporations. Um, but that's not true. Um, I can tell you, I, I did not have one investor that said that was a reason for them not to invest. In fact, people tended to, to love the authenticity of the brand and the fact that we did that. So um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, how, many, how much time do we have? I can take questions forever, but. Let's do five more minutes. Five more minutes, perfect, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so baby.com.br, it's a great question. It was about, you know, we tested a bunch of these other ideas. In fact, over the summer in Silicon Valley, we tested, we had these four ideas. These other three ideas, we tested. We spent money building sites. We found some way to test the idea. The one exception to the testing was the, was the Brazil business. This one was really hard for us because we couldn't go build a site in Brazil and start selling because you couldn't legally without a business entity. Um, we had no connections. We knew nobody in Brazil. We didn't have product that, you know, we weren't even living there, so it was hard for us to even go fulfill something if we sold it. So the way we kind of got around that was we did a, we did a survey. We hired a company um, in Brazil that did surveys, and we targeted 200 women that were moms that were internet users. And we asked them like 80, 70 or 80 questions. And these questions basically helped us understand how much they'd actually want and be willing to buy something online. What we found out was that these women hated shopping for baby products because it was a nightmare. The traffic in Sao Paulo is insane. I was five miles, my, my, we lived in this high rise. Um, from there to my office was five miles. It took me up to two hours one way to get to work every day. So I was in a car like three hours a day at least and it was a nightmare. <laughs> and um, you can imagine if you're a mom and especially in a, in a middle class, you know, emerging middle class where Maybe you only have one car or no cars in your family. If you're a new mom, you probably don't have a car. 
So um, going on shopping for baby products in like public transportation, you know, it was a nightmare. There are oftentimes, a lot of them we found out through the survey were shopping at, gro at um, um, pharmacies that were more convenient, they were closer, um, but they were a lot more expensive than if they went to Walmart. The problem is they couldn't go to Walmart because it would take an hour and a half or two hours to get to a Walmart on, a, on public transportation. So um, we found there was an incredible need. And um, so that's kind of how we tested the baby space was through really deep research in the, in, in the baby space there. Um, I spent literally hundreds of hours digging into the baby space in Brazil because I wanted to know everything about it. I became like an understudy of diapers.com, of any e-commerce business in the US that had sold baby products, of any e-commerce business in Brazil. I knew, I just dug into everything I could find so that I knew the space very well. So that's, that's kind of the way we, we tested it. Good, good question. Yeah. Uh, what about like manufacturing of, of the vaccine? I mm -hmm. know that it was like, you carry those things from what you do with the company and that kind of stuff. How do you manufacture the gear? Yeah, so the question is how we choose manufacturing facilities for our gear, Cotopaxi gear. So obviously the social mission um, isn't just what we can do on, the, on you know, on, when we sell the gear, it's also on the back end. How is this being made? And so this is something we take very, very seriously. And we're very careful in how we vet the manufacturers that we use. And so uh, I can give you an example. In our pack factory is in the Philippines. And um, it's an incredible, I've been manufacturing in Asia for over 10 years. And I've never seen anything like this. It is unreal. Um, the average employee has been there for 11 and a half years. Um, they rock 80s music all the time. <laughs> It is super fun. Um, they have like basketball and volleyball tournaments. They have a, a pool where they teach people to scuba dive. Um, it is like, it is crazy. It's a crazy place. It's like, and people have been there forever. They're some of the most skilled sewers I've ever met. They take pride in their craft. And um, it's just, it's amazing to be there. And so when we got there, we took an AP photographer, hired them to come document the factory. They went around, took photographs of the factory and we put it up on our site. So um, transparency is very important to us. Um, choosing the right factory. And are these guys more expensive? Yeah, they are. You know, this is more expensive to make a pack there than it is in some other place. But they make the pack right. The pack's gonna last. It's made well. We know it was made by people that love their jobs. That, um, you know, it's something we care a lot about. In fact, we're one of the first companies to join an uh, organization, a nonprofit that helps, sh um, it, they built a software that helps show that you don't use slave labor in any part of your your supply chain, which is really challenging, believe it or not. And so um, that's how committed we are to it. I think a lot of companies are afraid to do that because they don't want to get exposed. But you know, if we get exposed, great. You know, then we, that's something we want to fix. Um, so it's something we take really seriously. It's a great, great question. Maybe last question. Oh, sorry. humanitarian and big and so as far as like they're keeping the lights on and expanding and you know, even for the, the, the best of intentions you know, I want to expand so I can get more people and I can help the poor people in China and wherever else too or almost in Chicago or something. Mm -hmm. how, how do you have that like a bigger footprint and, and more profitable and you know still keep your kids afloat and you know yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there is. There's definitely. Um, I think. That I think if I understood the question correctly, is that it's tough to balance building a business and having a social mission at the same time. Is that kind of what you're yeah. getting at? Well, I mean, it, it's just like you always see like the don't kill the puppy, make something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, kind of balancing like the social side and, and, and the business side is definitely challenging. And it's, it's something I, I won't lie to you and say that we've nailed it, we've totally figured it out, we've cracked the nut. We haven't, you know, we're, we're figuring this out. And I'm sure we'll look back in a couple of years and say, wow, I have a great story to tell you about how we screwed that up, you know? So um, uh, all you can do is do your best. And um, we're trying, to, we're trying to do that. And I, I, of course, we have to focus. There's days where I go home and I think, man, 
all I thought about today was business. It was like, how do I grow the brand? How do I solve this problem? How do I put out that fire? And I didn't even think about the kids that were helping in, you know, in Southeast Asia or in Africa. And um, you know what? Sometimes it's easy to beat yourself up about that, but uh, you know what? You just do the best you can. And for us, we have to balance that. And um, you know, we're we're actually working right now to hire a chief impact officer, someone whose job, their sole job, is to make sure that we're executing on our mission to change the world. And so. Um, it is a tough balance, but uh, I really believe that businesses, if they take it serious and if it's authentic to who they are, I think that it, this is something that businesses can and will do. And I think it's amazing, you guys are in this generation that you're going to start seeing a change in business where businesses are a force for good in the world. And um, it's super exciting to see and to be a part of. So um, thanks again for letting me be here. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>